What's up my stat stars? Welcome to part three of the unit six summary review video for inference for categorical data with an emphasis on proportions. In this video, we're going to focus on a two sample Z test for the difference between two population proportions. Now, this can be a little bit tricky, but it's gonna follow the same basic four steps to a one sample Z test. Now in a two sample Z test for the difference between two population proportions, what we're focusing on is exactly that, the difference between two population proportions. So we have population proportion one, population proportion two, and we're wondering, are they different? So what do we do? We take a sample from population one, we take a sample from population two, and we look at those sample proportions and we say, all right, are they far enough apart that we can officially say that they're different or are they just too close that, well, maybe there's really no difference. So we're gonna follow the same basic outline of the four steps that we did with a one sample Z test, but this time we're looking at two samples and we're focusing on the difference. All right, so let's run through those four steps right now and then we'll finish it off by looking at a full example. All right, step one is naming the test. This is a two sample Z test for the difference of two population proportions. And then you actually want to, in a real problem, identify with those two population proportions, like the proportion of boys that do their homework every night versus the proportion of girls that do their homework every night. Now you gotta make sure that you then write your hypotheses. The null hypothesis is that everything is the same. There is absolutely no difference between these population proportions. So we have P1 equals P2. Very simple, the proportion of girls that do their homework is exactly equal to the proportion of boys that do their homework. Now the alternative is, well, one of three options. And this is all based on reading what the question is claiming. Do they claim that the proportion from population one is greater than the proportion from population two or that it's less than, or we don't really care who's higher, who's lower. We just care that the two proportions are not the same mean that they're not equal to each other. So you have to actually pick which one of those alternatives you want based on what is said in the problem. Then step two is checking those conditions and building that sampling distributions. Now you gotta check the conditions for both samples so it's not a ton of fun. Hopefully we get that red flashing lights that says that all conditions are met, which does actually happen quite often on the AP exam. Now, when we build our model, we have to assume that the null hypothesis is true. And remember, the null hypothesis is that these two samples are, or these two populations, excuse me, are absolutely no different. The proportion from population one is exactly equal to the proportion from population two, which means that the difference is zero. There is no difference. All right, so there's our, there's our mean. There's the mean of our sampling distribution, big, fat, beautiful, zero. There is no difference. Next comes up the standard deviation. But since we don't know what the population proportions are, we actually can't use our formula for standard deviation. Now here is what that formula for standard deviation between two samples is. You may remember this back from unit five, but well, the idea though is like, okay, the null is that they're equal, that means the difference is zero, but what are they? Are they 16% and 16% and the difference is zero? Or are they 80%, 80% the difference is zero? We don't know, so we actually can't use our standard deviation formula because we don't know the individual true population proportions from population one and population two. So it looks like we're gonna have to go to our old friend standard error that we did when we talked about confidence intervals. Okay, because we do know our samples. But this comes with another hitch. Remember, we have to assume that there is no difference. So if there is no difference, then why don't we just put all of the data together and make one giant sample? If there's no difference, why even look at them differently? Okay, we call this our combined sample proportion. So here we're putting our two sample sizes together in the denominator, and we're putting all of our successes together in the numerator. That would be the proportion from sample one times the sample size, plus the proportion from sample two times its sample size on top. Now, all this is doing is this is saying, hey, remember, we're assuming that there's no difference, so let's just combine them all together. Then we could calculate what we call the standard error combined. The standard error combined is the same formula for standard error of the difference between two population proportions, but we're using that same combined sample proportion in both numerators. So you'll notice the numerators are both exactly the same, but the denominators are different. Now, this is only used in a 
two sample Z tests. I cannot stress that enough. We don't do this at all in a one sample Z test because there's no question about what the truth could be because in a one sample test, we assume the null is true, so we know what that is. But here, all we're claiming is that they're equal, which means there's no difference, but we don't know what they are. That's why we have to go to our sample data, but because we are assuming there's no difference, we put them all together to get this P hat C, or our P hat combined, which allows us to calculate the standard error combined. This is the one thing that really gets tricky for some students on the AP exam. So all I could say is process this. I got a ton of other videos that talk more in depth about this, but just kind of make sure you understand these formulas. Now, what we do know is this, we can also factor out that common numerator, and then we have that p hat c times one minus p hat c times one over sample size one plus one over sample size two, all inside the square root. There's a couple different ways you can write it, but they're all mathematically equivalent. All right, so in step two, we gotta check those conditions and find the mean and standard error combined on the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. A little bit tricky, but hopefully when we look at examples, you'll settle in and understand it. So check those conditions. There's three of them for each sample. Create the mean of zero, because we're assuming there is no difference, and then build that standard error combined. I know it's a little bit hard to understand, but it's actually pretty easy to mathematically calculate. All right, step three is where we're actually gonna go ahead and build the sampling distribution, and then find our test statistic, our z-score, and find our p-value. So this is where we're actually gonna look at our difference. What was the difference we saw between our two sample proportions? That's the observed difference. We're gonna calculate our z-score by taking that value and subtracting zero. Remember zero was the null, what we assumed to be true, what we centered our sampling distribution on, there's no difference, divided by that combined standard error. All right, then we're gonna get our p-value, which is the probability that our difference is, well, anything more extreme, right? That's the whole idea of a p-value. It's the probability that any other difference is more extreme than the difference we observed. And that's going to be, you know, gonna actually calculate that probability with our z-score, going to our normal table, our normal CDF, to actually get that probability. And again, I know that this might be like, okay, he got me lost right now. I'm a little bit confused. Just bear with me. I know there's a lot of big words and big explanations, but when we look at an example, I think it'll make a lot more sense. And then finally, step four is making our conclusion. Same thing as we did with a one sample Z test. First, we're gonna compare our p-value to our level of significance. If our p-value is less than our level of significance, we're gonna reject the null, which means we do have evidence that the alternative is true. And if our p-value is more than our level of significance, we're gonna to fail to reject the null. We do not accept the null. We just say that, we, hey, we just don't have enough evidence to go with the alternative. All right, that's it for the four steps. Should sound very familiar overall. Step two, building that standard error combined, I know gets a little bit tricky, so just bear with me. When I show you an example here in one second, I think you'll really understand it. But the framework is exactly the same for a one sample Z test as for a two sample Z test. We're just working with two different proportions and we're looking at the difference between them. All right, so here is this example and I really think all the steps are gonna come together and make a lot of sense after we look at this example. All right. The CEO of a toy company is very concerned that the proportion of defective toys produced during the night shift is higher than the proportion of defective toys produced during the day shift. So we got two populations, day shift workers, night shift workers, toys from the day shift, toys from the night shift, and we're looking at the proportion of defective toys from those two populations. Now, he is concerned that the proportion of defective toys during the night shift is higher. So to test this, he collects a random sample of 500 toys from each shift and examines the proportion of defective toys. Of the sample from the day shift, 37 were defective, and the sample from the night shift, 62 were defective. Let's run a test to determine if there is significant evidence that the proportion of defective toys produced by the night shift is greater than the day shift. Now, first, I like to process what our data tells us. So if we look at the proportion from the night shift and the proportion of the day shift, Night shift, 62 out of 500, it's about 12.4% defective toys. Um, day shift, 37 out of 500, that was about 7.4%. That's a difference of 5%. So our difference is 5%. This is the difference we observed. The night shift was 5% more. So the question is, is 5% a lot more that we should you know, fire the night shift, right? 
Or is it just like, I mean, it's a little bit more, but it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. Because remember, samples are allowed to vary. These are two samples. Just because we observe a 5% difference doesn't mean there is a 5% difference. That's the whole point of a test. If we take our observed difference and compare it to all possible differences in that sampling distribution, then we can get a really get a good feel of how weird or unweird this is. All right, so step one is naming the test. This is a two sample Z test for the difference in the proportion of defective toys produced by the night shift and day shift. Make sure you write that with context. All right, the null hypothesis is that the proportion of defective toys on the night shift is equal to the proportion of defective toys on the day shift, no difference whatsoever. And the alternative was very clear in this problem. We're concerned that the night shift proportion is greater than the day shift proportion. All right, step two is checking those conditions, which does feel like you're writing a book. It's not fun, I know. Nobody loves the conditions, but they do have to be checked. All right, then I think the fun part is actually building the model. So first, what is the model? It's the sampling distribution that shows us all possible differences between the day shift and night shift. And we're gonna assume that there's no difference, which is our null hypothesis, meaning that they're equal. And if they're equal, that's a difference of zero in the middle. Then this is where that tricky part comes in. We need that standard error combined because we're assuming there's no difference. Then why even look at day shift first night shift? Let's just put them all together. So that's looking at one sample of 1000 toys, 500 from the day plus 500 from the night. And then that was 99 total defective um, toys, the 37 plus the 62. So I get 0 0.099. That's my combined P hat, my P hat combined. I then use that P hat combined in my standard error formula. So I put the 0 0.099 and it's one minus that 0 0.901 on the numerators for both. And then my denominators are both 500. Now, again, I can write that formula several different ways. I can factor out that numerator. I could just do it once and times it by two since they both are exactly the same. But at the end of the day, just calculate it and we get 0 0.0189. All right, now comes the fun part, actually calculating our test statistic, our z-score and our p-value. So we're imagining this model with zero in the middle, some sample differences are allowed to be higher, some sample differences are allowed to be lower. All right, so let's first start with what our difference was. That was back to that 0.05, that 5% difference we observed. So we're gonna take that 0.05 difference, we're gonna subtract zero, because we're assuming there's no difference, that's our center. So it gives us a numerator of 0.05, and the denominator is our standard error combined, the 0.0189. That gives us a z-score of 2.6455, which for z-scores, that's pretty high. Then comes our p-value. Now make sure you understand what a p-value is. It is the probability that any other difference between a sample from the night shift and a sample of the day shift is more extreme than ours. Now, why did I do greater than? Because I had a positive value, 0.05 is to the right of zero. So a p-value is more extreme than what we saw. We saw 0.05, the p-value is the probability that something would be even more than that, which is a z-score more than 2.6455. Use your normal model tables, your normal model calculator to get 0.0041. So assuming there is no difference in the proportion of defective toys between the two shifts, the probability of seeing a 5% difference is 0.0041. It's very, very unlikely. If we assume there's no difference, Basically, we should not have seen a difference of 5%. But guess what? We did see a difference of 5%, and that's what tells us something really important that we can mention in our conclusion. Since our p-value of 0.0041 is less than 0.01, I'm going to reject the null. There is significant evidence that the proportion of defective toys produced by the day night shift is greater than the proportion of defective toys produced by the day shift. So at the end of the day, here's what I found out. Our sample of 5% was extremely unlikely. It should not have happened. So when something unlikely happens, we have to have a logical conclusion. And the logical conclusion is the center of zero is wrong and that it's actually higher, which would mean that it's true. The night shift does have a higher proportion of defective toys than the day shift. All right, that's it for a two sample Z test. I hope it all made sense. I know that that standard error combined can get a little bit confusing, but again, it all goes back to the fact that when I build that model, I have to assume there's no difference. So if there's no difference, let's just put them all together. Um, a lot of textbooks call that pooling. You're just putting everybody in the same pool. I call it standard error combined. I think that's what the curriculum calls it nowadays. So we're combining. The only time you would ever do that is in a 
two sample Z tests. And I gotta be honest with you, if you would forget to combine it and just kind of treat the two samples separately, you actually can still get full credit on the AP exam as long as you're showing all of your work and understanding exactly what you're doing. That's the key thing. Not just knowing the framework, but understanding the framework for the four steps. Building the hypotheses, creating the model, testing the, or checking those conditions, and then figuring out where does my sample fall, because that's the most important part. That's why sampling distributions are so vital to this process. Sampling distributions show us what all possible differences between two samples could look like. And now it's time for us to say, where is our observed difference? If it's in the middle, then it's not weird. It's not enough for me to reject the null and say that the alternative is true. But if it's really, really, really unlikely out on those tails, that's why I can go ahead and reject the null and say, listen, I think that this sample we found was very special. It should not have happened, but it did. The most logical conclusion is that that null hypothesis is in fact incorrect. That's why I'm gonna go with the alternative. That's the basic framework for a test of significance or a hypothesis test. All right, that's it for the unit six summary review video. A lot going on. I hope all the different pieces made sense. We got confidence intervals, we got tests, we got one sample intervals, one sample test, two sample intervals, two sample tests. There's a lot going on. So process it all, do the study guide, practice all those problems. I think it'll really help you. Good luck getting ready for your unit six test and on the AP exam.